Yeah, the CPAC folks, you can keep your cameras off, um, although I know you'll be back. And I just want to check to see if we have the policy roundtable folks ready. I see Dr. Dodge, thank you. And Danielle, thank you again. And hopefully we'll get Anand back and Kimberly back. Lise, will you let me know if we have any um, issues related to our payers? I'm not seeing either of them right now. Jennifer, there you are. <laughs> All right, so we're, just, we're still just missing Tony Grillo, I guess. So if you don't mind shooting him an email. And we will give folks, again, at least another minute. It's not quite at the hour yet. All right, we're going to wait again about 30 seconds and then we'll go ahead and get started. Tony, I'm told you are here, so welcome. Yeah, I'm not seeing his picture though, so. Can you hear me, Steve? There you are. There you are. Now I can see and hear you. Thanks, Tony. All right, I'm just waiting for Kimberly to be back, but we'll start in about 30 seconds at most. And you guys, I will introduce you, the, the new folks. Kimberly's back. Okay, fantastic. Welcome back. Um, this is the policy roundtable uh, portion of our day. We have an hour and a half uh, to cover a lot of ground, and we have some great people at the table to help us look broader across the health system, um, and also dive deeper into some of the specific issues that have even come up. Um, but we're, we're moving towards the broader considerations around pricing, coverage, uh, clinical um, use and patient engagement and equity. So the participants for the roundtable include the folks that have been with us um, uh, all day from the clinical expert side. We have uh, Dr. Danielle Brandman and we have Dr. Dr. Adnan Saeed. We also have Kimberly Martinez, who's a patient expert. Um, and um, he gave a uh, public comment earlier, but I'd like to reintroduce Dr. Stephen Dodge, who's the Senior VP in, for Global Medical Affairs at Madrigal Pharmaceuticals. And let's let the other two folks who have not been on the call at all yet introduce themselves. So first, um, Anthony, I know him as Tony. Uh, Grillo, Tony, want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, Tony Grillo um, with Express Scripts. I lead our from a strategy and contracting um, team for, uh, for Express Scripts, and we have various uh, Pair, pair of clients that we serve. Thank you. And you can ever, you can see all the conflicts of interest again recapitulated there on the slide. Um, and Jennifer Martin, please introduce yourself. Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Martin. I am Deputy Chief Consultant for um, VA's Pharmacy Benefits Management Service. I oversee our formulary management branch, um, which you know manages our national formulary as well as any activities that have to do with contracting for pharmaceuticals for VA. Welcome and thank you to, to both you folks. Um, and because we are going to spend a fair amount, you guys are obviously the ones who end up staying up late at night if you have to think about um, a new drug being introduced that could be eligible, could be uh, used, I guess, amongst a very broad population. So we'll, we'll kind of address a lot of those issues. Um, I'd like to start though, by just kind of stepping back and talking about health equity again, um, we did kind of focus the voting around a specific drug and its relative effectiveness, but I really do want to step back and think, let's assume that we have uh, some new treatments available for patients with NASH. What does the whole system, the whole ecosystem have to do to get it right, to get access right, to get pricing right, to get knowledge right? to address health equity issues. And it, this could include diagno diagnosis issues as well, about what methods are being used for diagnosis um, and how we get uh, knowledge and availability of this um, appropriately kind of spread out. 
So you can you can think about any element there you want, um, but do it when I, when we talk about equity, it's sometimes easy to get lost in the in the breadth of it all. But um, I sometimes uh, and I benefited from a conversation I had with one of the CPAC members recently. Want to think even deeper about you know patients who might really struggle with housing, with food, with transportation issues. You know what do we need to do to get this right for them? Let me start with the clinical experts on that, if you don't mind. So, for, you know, as you think about this, you guys, in some ways, you sit at the top of a pyramid, right? At the top of the iceberg. And now if there's a new treatment, you're going to see lots of questions about how primary care, how health systems, how insurers, you know, everybody has to kind of change their approach. What needs to happen in your minds to get this right when we think about health equity as our primary goal? Yeah. And you're, oh, Adnan, go ahead. Oh, sorry. So I, I, a lot of education, a lot of awareness, and a lot of collaboration um, uh, are important. So this is, as, a, as we've been talking, a silent condition until it's too late, until they come to the advanced liver disease clinic. And, and by that time, the treatments may become less effective or they may, come, may become very costly, uh, both in terms of money as well as in terms of societal impact and personal impact. And so early recognition and diagnosis has been one of the challenges uh, in, you know, in, in the medical field. And even before the medical field, maybe we're not gonna talk too much about it, but from a societal perspective, what are the health inequities that lead to development of this condition starting from early child, uh, childhood to adulthood in terms of access to healthy food, uh, food deserts and, uh, and and neighborhood and built environments. And those are important things, but not necessarily something that we're talking about as much. Uh, there are not enough gastroenterologists and hepatologists to treat this condition. Uh, there's barely enough us, of us to take care of liver transplants. And so there, this really needs to uh, be brought into uh, the forum where primary care is. So early identification, has been one of the challenges because up until now, because of a lack of evidence of effective treatments, there has been no guidance uh, to, to diagnose and screen for this condition. And that's changed now. The Europeans came at it a little early. So a few years ago, they said you can do early case detection in, di in diabetes. And now the American societies like Liver Society and AGA and and, uh, and endocrine societies are saying early case detection. So that's where we need to partner with people in internal medicine, family medicine, uh, health systems, you know, uh, integrated health systems uh, across the country to find people who are at risk and find them early, get them appropriate care with lifestyle management first. And if they are, if they are progressing based on based on uh, biomarkers, then to get them these treatments. So these treatments won't be for the entire breadth of NAFL people, nor do they need them. But these are really important for a subset of people who are progressing. And so, 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 that's, so that's where I think we need to collaborate with, uh, with these health systems to find people early and get them this treatment. I want to, I want to let, uh... Dr. Bradman comment as well, but before I do, I just want to point out uh, there, there's there's obviously a potential uh, tension here. If if we wanted to screen all obese uh, individuals for NASH, just the cost of that alone would be something that could uh, be hard, and it could end up making inequities even more difficult uh, to uh, you know more challenging in in some ways. I mean, there's there's no easy solution here, right? I mean, in, in terms of figuring out whom to screen and when, we'll talk more about that perhaps. But um, I understand that early identification is important, but I also wanted to point out when hepatitis C came along, people said, well, identify people and if they're early enough in their fibrosis, they don't need urgent treatment. That broke down pretty quickly. There were lawsuits, uh, patient advocacy groups said, no, we're not waiting. Um, if, if I find out that I've got it, I want it treated today. I don't want to wait to see if I'm progressing or not. So uh, some of the same clinician expert testimony that we had around the hepatitis C drugs at least did not create an easy pathway for that to occur in the health system uh, over time. Danielle, please take any part of that you want. 
Yeah, I think that's an important parallel, but to point out the, the difference is that hepatitis C is a disease that can be cured with a discrete period of treatment. Fatty liver disease is not in that way. Even though these drugs may have some impact on fibrosis, we're not going to cure the disease or the, the substrate that has led to fatty liver disease. Um, and, you know, we know that if we cure hepatitis C, we will prevent fibrosis progression. For fatty liver disease, if we are seeing all of the patients with early stage disease, we are basically seeing a third of the U.S. population in the hepatology clinics, and we just don't have that capacity. So I would echo what Adnan said in terms of, you know, identifying the high-risk patients um, and really taking kind of a triage type effect to have the patients who have indeterminate or high-risk scores on non-invasive testing, such as FIB4, which costs nothing, um, to identify those high-risk patients. But where the challenge is, is one, PCPs do a lot of things and they're addressing a lot of issues. So liver disease may not be high on the priority list, though that might change again, knowing that there may be treatments. And two, even if they do recognize it, do they have access to second line testing for fibrosis stage, such as FibroScan or MR elastography? Um, because even though FibroScan is much more available than it was you know, five years ago, um, a high quality FibroScan is not necessarily in every corner like a Starbucks is. Um, so I, I think even you know with disease recognition, that will certainly help, but I think we're still not going to reach all of the patients. And then finally, just going back to use of the electronic medical record and those tools, I think we have to make things easier for PCP so that it is kind of an automated step rather than taking the extra steps to say, let me look at this and let me calculate this. And then what do I do next? So I think as a system, we, you know, we need to help and make that better. Um, Steve, if you don't mind my asking you, um, you guys, I'm sure you're doing your own thinking about, you know, how to get equitable access to, to a new treatment, assuming it is approved by the FDA. Um, is And we've heard about information, early identification as being um, important from the clinical expert perspective. What does that look like from the manufacturer? What do you do? Do you launch a consumer education pro campaign? You know, is, you know, is, is your liver covered with fat? I mean, if you go online right now, you can find all kinds of horrific uh, pictures of livers covered with fat. And it's usually linked to some kind of magic diet uh, that you can take to solve it. Um, but, uh, you know, what's, what's this going to look like? And again, how do we get it right? How do we not oversell this and create, again, a problem with access? How do we reach the people that usually don't get kind of aware of the fact that they might have a high risk situation. What kind of thinking has your company put into that so far? So I'm happy to get to a chance to kind of comment on this. There's no simple solution. We've been thinking about this quite a bit, but I would say the first thing, I don't think we or anyone will get it exactly right. We're going to have to learn incrementally and figure this out. So I think I mentioned this in my comments. One of the things that we're specifically doing is we are focused on specialists who will treat the disease. And the reason we're doing that is initially, we don't believe the, the systems themselves are really ready to take on what would be potentially just an avalanche of patients if it, if it was activated that way. Um, we are going to work on how best to educate primary care to identify patients, but we're not going to push hard on that initially because this the systems of care just aren't ready for it. And to um, Dr. Nan's point, there just aren't enough treating specialists. In terms of the patients themselves, we're looking at it first with those patients that are already diagnosed. They're already in care in some way. How do we get those patients activated to then come and talk to their primary care provider or their specialist? specialists. And so you mentioned at one point um, that I have fatty liver disease, which may be all they've heard, um, and, and think about what would be next. We are going to be very thoughtful about how we would then prompt patients who are not identified or um, who have not received a diagnosis so that they, in fact, take a thoughtful approach as they approach primary care to get worked up. The challenge will be you could motivate enormous numbers of patients who in fact 
are very early in disease and overwhelm the system. And candidly, as we talk with hepatologists, for example, or gastroenterologists, that's one of the things they're afraid of is that they're just going to get overwhelmed. So it's a thoughtful approach. It is absolutely an approach that involves communicating directly to patients, predominantly early on patients who already have some idea that they have NASH, and then um, working from there in part as the systems themselves get better at dealing with what is going to happen. The last thing I'll say on this is an absence of treatment is, and I, I think this has been said, has been a bit of a break on the workup of patients with NASH. The presence of a treatment or more than one treatment is mm. going to turn that on its head. And what we are hoping and will work toward is making sure that's done in a thoughtful way because we don't really want to overwhelm the systems. It's not good for anyone if we do that. So let me ask a, a very challenging question. Um, and in a sense, it did come up around hepatitis C2 though. So let's assume that in the short term, we have a fair number of patients, I hate this term, but everybody uses it, warehoused. You know, they've been waiting for a, a, the first effective treatment. They know they've got NASH. They may know they have a fibrosis level that would qualify them for treatment. They're waiting. So you get a, a, a kind of a very rapid uptake among that group of patients um, who are already working with clinical experts, et cetera, et cetera. Then you get the secondary wave that comes out of either primary screening or some other kind of approach. Is it reasonable to manage access to an extent to help ensure equity? Is it reasonable or not to triage patients by their level of fibrosis within the FDA label? Let's say the FDA label is F2, F3. Is it reasonable to communicate to patients that you can wait? The average time to move from F2 to F3 is seven years. You've got F2, you've got no symptoms, you can wait. Is that something that works for individual patients? Is it something that works for health systems? Is it something that works for the US? Or are we just gonna be the kind of the same thing where check your get checked by your primary doctor, and you know, then it's just kind of a, a food fight in a sense for who gets through to the specialists. Steve, I mean, I, I'm putting you in a very tough position. You guys don't have an FDA label. I'm asking you about, would you split it in half? Um, I'll let you maybe sit on that for a second. Let me ask the clinical experts first. Could you imagine giving that advice to a health system? Don't send us your F2s. Well, I, I mean, I think a lot of, us who have run fatty liver clinics, we're already triaging some of these patients. Um, either if we see, if they have F0 to F1, um, that we can, and we feel confident in that assessment, then we can say, okay, you should follow up in primary care and your primary care provider should continue to monitor you. And I give very explicit instructions about when to send back. F2, I think is more complicated because I think we're much less certain in our assessment of who has F2, um, unless you have had some sort of, you know, fibrosis assessment, either biopsy, fiber scan, or MR elastography. Um, I mean, I, I would keep F2s in my practice because I worry, you know, about their risk of, of progression. I know. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with that approach. That's what we're doing clinically in terms of triaging these high-risk patients and then uh, sending the other patients back to primary and telling them how to follow them with FIP4 scores and, and risk factor management. Um, uh, obviously, it, it's hard. A F2 patient is going to want the drug if they know the trial shows it, and especially if they're in our clinic. So that, that's a motivated individual who's following up, who wants to be in a liver clinic and treated. So that that is probably the group F2 and F3 who will get treated first. It's the, it's the patients who are not necessarily coming back to clinic, not following up with F2, going to F3, that are gonna be a challenge. I, I think it's gonna be hard unless there's a, there's a, you know, something from a payer mix or a health system mix where it says we're not treating F2s initially that uh, apart from that, I think it's, it's we're gonna be treating all of them. Do you think the clinical specialty society are gonna get out in front of this um, or be kind of slow to move to create a, 
a, pub, a kind of clinical guideline around triaging patients in that way. No, I, I think they'll put out updates in their guidances pretty fast when something is approved. Um, um, and and they're you know they'll they'll put their level of evidence with it and and yeah I think they'll get out. Okay, because well. I'm going to turn to the to the payer delivery systems in a second because so they they often look for kind of authoritative clinical guidance to help guide their own sense of uh, of insurance coverage. And Kimberly, I'm going to round back to you in a set in a in a minute too to ask again about the equity aspects of all of this. You know, are, how do we make sure that we reach the patients who are, if you will, hard to reach or not very well connected to the health system already? So we'll, we'll do that. Um, okay, so Jennifer, you're, you're in an interesting situation because in a sense, you oversee the drug uh, system within a delivery system. And so you can't just think about the drug, you really do have to think about what's the connection to the diagnostic platform inside the VA, who's going to be doing that, who's going to get, et cetera, et cetera. So um, to the extent possible, where, where are you guys in your thinking about how you want to try to roll this out in a way that will help health equity and obviously achieve all of the goals that you have within the VA? Yeah, that's a tough question, actually. Um, there's a lot of players involved. You're absolutely right. When we're making pharmacy benefits, decisions, it, it's in that little silo of the pharmacy piece. We clearly can't do that here. Just looking at our preliminary numbers from a few years ago when we talked about this, to treat every patient would be almost double what our pharmacy budget is in total. So there has to be some prioritization. There has I, to be. I just want to make sure everybody hears that. And yeah. I want to make sure I understand, is that among currently known patients with NASH? who nope. you know already have F2 or F3 fibrosis? Or is that some kind of estimate of how many are out there, you just haven't found them yet? That's an estimate based on diagnosis codes from a couple years ago. So we didn't look at the stages. It's just the broad population of patients with NASH. So clearly okay. we're, we're going to have to prioritize and look at the different stages. Um, I look at this very much like we managed hepatitis C. I think um, that many of you are probably familiar with the fact that VA had pretty much the largest population of hepatitis C patients. Um, the year that the direct acting antivirals were approved, we ran out of money. We had to go back to Congress and ask for additional um, funding, which has not happened in history. <laughs> and for several years, we got a separate appropriation just for that. Part of our approach there was to work very closely with our partners, um, and I imagine it'll be a lot of the same group again, um, to align on looking at access to testing, clear diagnosis so that we're getting the right patients. Um, on top of our formulary guidance, we actually work jointly on prioritization to figure mm -hmm. out which patients to treat first, which were the highest risk. Um, it, as you mentioned before, you know, there's pushback on that. And we are an organization that is overseen by Congress. So I'm already imagining the congressionals and the inquiries from other places, but um, we're going to have to work very closely with our subject matter experts in the field and in our other program offices to really make sure all those pieces align um, because simply we can't afford to treat everyone um, right now. So uh, we haven't had a lot of those more global discussions at this point in time, uh, but I, I think that they're coming pretty soon. And then figuring out for the patients who are less severe, you know, lifestyle modifications. I, I can tell you um, those types of activities in our veterans in general, who we know have a higher proportion of obesity and, and other risk factors, um, really been a struggle. We know that we're under treating now too. And so in light of this, I think we need to work with the groups that are focused on that to beef up those efforts as well. Uh, so a lot of collaboration again across a lot of different areas, which is very different than how we make some of our other drug coverage decisions. We always involve their, our experts, but um, you know, I think this will be a much bri broader effort. Thanks. Uh, we're gonna come back to some of the more specific elements of coverage. Um, guidelines that would be developed. So we'll come back to the, the lifestyle management piece. But I just wanted to highlight that, you know, we've we've heard that to a certain extent, that's where there are existing inequities in terms of access to those. And we'll talk about what we mean by lifestyle management as opposed to a GLP-1 
these days? What, what are we talking about um, as part of the either the pre-treatment or the combined treatment with, uh, with these drugs? Uh, Tony, let me turn to you. So again, you don't directly oversee a health system, if, if, if you will, but you still have to think about how it interdigitates uh, with the diagnosis, diagnosis and, and other referral issues. So how are you guys going to yourselves address uh, kind of address the introduction of these treatments in a way that um, kind of meets your goals of helping with health disparities? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, so Steve, one of the things our, our clients, our payers look for is some predictability. Um, so, you know, the numbers that we throw around, around how many patients are potentially at some level of disease, like one in four um, is, a, is a big number. But that said, I think uh, from a payer perspective, uh, looking at new therapy like this is welcomed. And then the question of to your, uh, hep C is a good, a good um, analogy there where all of a sudden you have like a thousand people running towards one door, you know, this initial wave of getting these people treated. And then how do we do that? Especially in, I think where, where we're going to have um, some concerns and where can we help, you know, you know, a lot of these patients are already, from a clinical perspective, already very challenged in primary care and have a lot of other priorities that they're trying to work through. So how do you get that prioritized on the list, even for those patients that are, this is, they have a, a three or, you know, a two and being monitored, right? Like, this, you know, I think, you know, how do we, how do we enable the specialist to be able to, to, to step in and, and to help? And what I'd say after that, I mean, I, we, our payers have the same concern. How do we prioritize? There's other, other, um, indications where there's brand new therapies coming out and there's just not enough docs, there's not enough testing. Um, and so how do you find the, 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 the highest priority, you know, uh, and so that's what we would be focused on and partnering with, um, you know, providers and manufacturers to, to do that. Thanks. So Kimberly, back over to you. So when you hear the term health equity or health disparities, and you think about the launch of these two drugs, what do you think everyone at the table here, the manufacturer, the payers, the clinical experts, and even the patient community, what has to happen so that we get it right? Okay, I think um, going back to the first remark, you said screening, you said you just can't go screen everybody. But you can screen people that have obesity along with family history, along with prediabetes. They, there's different criteria that you can go and you can get those people screened. Um, as far as education, I think it should be uh, brought to the community with PSAs through primary care doctors, like Danielle said earlier. She, they would more likely be um, more open to talking about liver disease if there was a drug on the market that would help, along with lifestyle changes. Um, and in it's brand new, 2023, the ASLD, uh, they say that people at risk should be screened. So I agree with them. I mean, I know everyone's worried about the onslaught of too many patients, but there's a lot of people out there that need help. And so, like you said, we need to triage. And I think that uh, the people that meet the criteria of like two or three you know, risk factors, they, they should be in the front of the line. Uh, and as far as just diversified communities, you need to go to those, um, you know, groups, those uh, community groups and educate. Thank you. That's, that's really helpful. Um, I know we've been talking uh, in terms of the health systems, you know, the limitations on the number of specialists, the flows of newly diagnosed patients, et cetera, which sound like structural issues. I just want to ask the payers their opinion, I guess, or their, their perspective. How much will the price that is put on these drugs affect the ways that you can or will kind of cover them in conjunction with the diagnostic and other kind of system issues? I mean, we had one meeting where the insurer said, look, to be honest, if this drug comes out at you know, a high pr a price that we deem is really not reasonable with value, it's, it's going to have you know, more difficult access. There's going to be more prior auth. It's going to be more challenging. We're going to have to narrow the number that are gonna be uh, covered in some way. Um, and likewise, if the price comes in low, if you will, within the value scheme, it, it'll affect our the way that we can cover it. Is that gonna be the case here or not in some way? Jen, let me ask you that first. I know it's a, it's a hard question because 
it, it drives at some of the tender points in our overall health system. But what, what, what would you say? Yeah, when we make a formulary coverage decision, we look at three factors. We look at safety first, we look at efficacy second, and then we look at cost as a third driver. Um, I would sound completely naive if I said that we could just not look at cost at all and it, it wouldn't matter here. We've been really successful um, within VA in the past at driving the prices down. Um, again, I'm going back to hepatitis C. You know, we got to a point where we had the, some of the lowest prices in the country, and they were almost even across all the treatments, um, because mm -hmm. we've shown that we can be pretty effective driving treatment one way or the other, uh, you know, if we need to. We're a closed system, our providers are all our employees, so we have a lot of control that way. My concern with this one, when I'm looking at it, everything I've read so far from a tolerability standpoint and, you know efficacy standpoint, it might lean more towards one drug than the other. Um, so that's going to be a little bit tougher, uh, depending on where the pricing falls. But I do think that, you know, if there's a huge difference in price between one drug and the other, that will have to be taken into consideration with our guidance. It's just hard to know. Um, interestingly, I am the pharmaceutical industry liaison for VA. Neither companies approached me to talk any preliminary pricing or anything else yet. So it's hard to know where that will fall. Um, but again, it has to be part of the decision-making. As I said earlier, um, you know, if we treated everybody, it would be double our pharmaceutical budget for all drugs, inpatient and outpatient. So um, I think it will guide our decision-making. The unique thing about VA is all drugs are covered. So we will not end up in a situation where we say, we'll only cover one. We won't cover both. Um, if they're both approved, there will be some access to coverage, but, um, you know, cost will factor into that once we get through safety and efficacy. We tend to align very closely to the clinical trials, um, sometimes more than the FDA label in terms of coming up with our patient selection criteria. So what mm -hmm. I assume will happen is we'll fit the criteria based on what we see in those trials and then figure out how the price interplays into that after the fact. Yeah, and actually we're gonna run through the clinical trial criteria to see which march over into insurance coverage more kind of uh, rationally or irrationally in, in some ways. But Tony, I wanna like, give you a chance to address that as well in terms of the influence of pricing on how we can get the right kinds of access. Yeah, thanks Steve. So, I mean, so basically I'll, I'll say there's, there's two different types of main situations. One is where we have clients that have their own P&T, their own medical resources that then make those coverage decisions and those formulator decisions. And then we have our standard. Um, and with our standard formularies, I would you know, echo Jennifer, we are clinical first. We have our own P&T that makes a, makes a termination on, on, uh, on, the, on the clinical um, pieces of the drug and cost is not taken into consideration there. After that, then you layer on some of those cost, those cost pieces and I, I think, you know, there will be a, a question around uh, where the data uh, within the, you know, within the clinical trials and what patients, what their exclusion criteria was, what that looks like on if we need to prioritize patients. And mm -hmm. I, I just, I think about when I hear um, some of the talk around, you know, what, pa what patients some of the pharma pharmaceutical manufacturers are targeting and does that speak to what their pricing is going to be um, around what they see the opportunity of patients that are likely going to be treated, right? Is this is this a specialist specific or is this primary care? And that a lot of times for me that that gives a little bit of a insight into how things are going to be priced and then how some of the payers are going to look at it from a budget perspective. So to be clear, you mean if it's if the word on the street is that it's going to be targeted to specialists, you're anticipating a higher price, mm -hmm. which would which would worry you because you think it would sprinkle down into primary care or, I mean, what would your reaction be to, to well, that? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, so I think this is where, um, if it's being launched in a, in a situation where um, we think that it's gonna be pretty much uh, segregated to, to, the, to the specialist areas and it's priced that way, the question is that does the data then lend itself towards a, a, a certain type of patient where, you know, again, certain fibrosis scores or things like that, right? Like, is that is that what that's going to look like? And I think, um, again, clinical first, right? Like, 
On top of that, if the data shows that this is a, a very small portion of the population, then you know the payers may have the expectation to to, to enforce criteria based on uh, based on that. If it's not, then you know again one one there's no other therapy. Um, you know, I think then then it lends itself towards more of a of um, not not putting those tools into place. Okay, thanks. All right, so I do now want to move to um, kind of the different stages or different components of a coverage policy. Um, every insurer in the country has to do this on their own, um, but there, there kind of is a common approach to how it's laid out in terms of def defining the diagnosis and what the eligibility criteria are for coverage, whether there are any exclusion criteria, that kind of thing, almost like a clinical trial. Um, but even before I get there, I want to ask a broad question of the clinical experts. Um, do you need both drugs? I know that one's going to be approved if, you know, let's assume that they're both approved. The cycle would have OCA approved first, and then you'd get Rosmetaram sometime maybe either late this year with a breakthrough designation, perhaps. Um, so again, insurers, much like hepatitis C, might start to think, do I need both of these drugs on my formulary, or can I just pick one and use that as a part of my negotiation to get a better price for everybody. So they'll turn to clinical experts and say, can we get by with one or the other? What I mean, my, my opinion is taking a patient-centered approach. Absolutely, yes, we do need both drugs um, because even though we know what the rate of side effects are and what the specific side effects are, to say to an individual patient, you are going to have these side effects with this drug versus these with this drug definitively, there's no way, no way that we can know that. Um, I think patients sometimes have opinions about which medication they would prefer. And if we feel comfortable with the safety and efficacy being similar between those two medications, mm -hmm. then I, I think it's appropriate to offer that choice. Adnan, go ahead. I'll, I'm actually going to push back gently, I hope, but I'm going to, I'm just going to kind of pose a slight devil's advocate there and then ask the, the maybe the payers a bit. But Adnan, let, let's say the question comes a little bit more pointed version. Do I have to have both of these drugs? Now, by that, I don't mean that you can use the other one, you know, by filling out a medical exception form, but I want to get a lower price by saying, hey, you know, you two companies, I'm only going to put one of you guys as the one that my docs can easily prescribe. Um, does that make sense? Are there gonna be some patients for whom you would say, uh-uh, you have to have drug A or you have to have drug B from a clinical perspective? So besides the price competition, which, which from hep C we know is exceptionally important in terms of contracting, yeah. we don't have that, da that data yet to know which drug is better in which phenotype or genotype combination of patients, but I'm hopeful that as these drugs get approved and remain in clinical trials and other trials happen, that we will find the spectrum of patients in which drug A works better and another spectrum in which drug B works better. And, and yes, they, they work in different ways, right? One works in, 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 in a way where maybe it's better for patients with high lipid, high, higher lipids, but we don't know that because it's used, it was used broadly and the other one works in FXR and and, and gluconeogenesis and triglyceride handling. So exceptionally important to have both to try and figure out, as Daniela said, who will benefit from these drugs over the long run as well and, and welcome more entrance into the market. So Daniel, I'll come back with the more pointed version of this. And this does relate to the early history around the hepatitis C drugs, which I'm sure you both remember quite well. Mm -hmm. um, OCA has a um, higher rate of side effects um, right now, let's assume that the evidence on benefits is about the same. It's in the same ballpark, 25 to 30% uh, kind of get the positive outcome from the trial. One has higher side effects. If a payer says, I can get a much lower price on the one with the pruritus, uh, mm -hmm. can I go ahead and basically have coverage go through that drug first? Or is that going to be enough of a difference clinically the clinical experts will rise up and march into the streets of America saying, hell no, I need to prescribe the other one without pruritus. If you want that to be the only one on the formulary, I'll, I'll listen to you, but not the other way around. 
Yeah. No, I think it's a fair question. And I think the question is really how much do a patient's side effects cost? And I think that's hard to quantify. But I think, you know, thinking about a specific patient, like let's say there's a patient who has known CAD or who has difficult to control hyperlipidemia or has been intolerant of statins, Mm -hmm. then I'd be very hesitant to use obeta-colic acid, even though we don't have you know, data showing that there's increased risk of cardiac disease. Um, so I think in a, in a patient like that, I want the choice to be able to offer them resmeteron. I think resmeteron, I don't necessarily, I mean, if a patient has kind of baseline irritable bowel syndrome and, you know, diarrhea either consistently or intermittently, I need the choice to not use resmeteron preferentially because of the concern of side effect of diarrhea. So payers, I've been making this up a bit, right? I've been, it's kind of, I've created this little puppet show around a potential negotiation and a thought about one or the other. Um, What runs through your minds? If you heard the earlier discussion today, you may know the data yourselves on these two drugs, but is this a a situation in which you would be looking to potentially um, strongly favor one drug or the other, potentially by excluding one entirely from the formulary? Um, uh, Tony, we start with you in in that case, because it was Express Scripts that was quite um, prominent in the early days of hepatitis C by excluding Sovaldi while accepting Vicuripac for treatment of patients with hepatitis C, at least for a short while. In that, in that vein, is this something that you could envision doing around NASH? Well, I would say, I mean, just, just first, I mean, overall, we believe competition is a good thing. Um, having having option optionality is a good thing. It's a good thing for patients. Uh, it's a good thing for physicians and providers. It's a good thing typically for pricing. So, I mean, and the reason is, right, like the competition hopefully drive, drives down some of the pricing. As far as like the example of do I do I cover one or not cover ever, do I prefer one, do not per, per another? I mean, I would say, first of all, you know, it, it's, it is clinical first and your example of Sivaldi and Vicuripac and what type of, uh, Genotypes it covers, like there's there's certain there were certain clinical exceptions associated with that, and I was able to call in um, and hear some of the um, some of the pieces around you know the uh, increase in LDL and the pruritus and uh, diarrhea things like that. So um, I think overall, payers would prefer to provide access to both therapies because they're differentiated enough from a clinical perspective and a um, and a, you know side effect profile. Uh, that said, you know, uh, competition, you know, driving down the prices and seeing where it, it's, it stacks up, I mean, that, that'll be a consideration, I think. Um, but this isn't, this isn't a situation where, like, there, there are two ARBs with the same mechanism, right? These are, these are differentiated enough that I, I think, you know, first we got to follow the clinical, uh, see where things fall. And we're going we're gonna to follow our, our, our clinical guidance around what those guardrails are. And there is likely to be um, some differentiation between the two. Yeah, and Jennifer, I'm putting you and Tony in uncomfortable situation. I try to put everybody in an uncomfortable situation at least once or twice during this call. I hope you don't mind. You can do the same to me um, anytime. So again, the VA is thought of as being um, pretty tough when it needs to be in terms of negotiation. And um, you know, it can move, as you said, market share uh, more effectively than many delivery systems. So are you looking at this yet as a situation in which you would be approaching the possibility of only basic, I know you cover them both, but really moving strongly towards the use of one or the other? I would say that is a possibility. Um, Again, they will both be available, um, but we could give preferential status to one versus the other. The way that we design our our criteria that dictate our coverage are very similar to a clinical trial though. So we have inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. So I think if we were looking to prefer one over the other, um, one we would consider formulary prior authorization. Um, Again, I'm assuming it will have the criteria. And I think patients who aren't ideal candidates for that, either because of lipids, diarrhea, things like that, we would carve those out as exclusion, and that would kind of be a step that they could get the other drug without too much push. Um, but similar to Hep C, um, it sounds like we were similar to Express Scripts. We did try to push Vicuripac in the beginning. We got much better pricing. We understood the dosing regimen was harder. 
drug drug interactions were more complicated, but when patients were appropriate and they didn't have contraindications or didn't seem like they were having problems, you know, that was our go-to drug. And so I, I think we're going to have to do something like that in this case because it will help us drive the prices down. Um, that was very effective for us with Hep C. We were able to get the prices pretty much equal across all the drugs um, as they got approved. Um, but again, we will have very specific patient criteria for who's not a good candidate for drug A or drug B to, and make sure that they have access to the other one. Thanks. Okay, I'm sensitive of the time. I want to dive into the specifics again of the co what a coverage policy will look like, no matter who the insurer is. Um, and the first step again is the diagnosis um, uh, and, and kind of blending that with the inclusion criteria. Let me just again read from the key trial, and I'm focusing here on resmitiram, but I think they're almost identical between the two. So inclusion criteria was biopsy proven NASH with fibrosis stages greater than or equal to one to less than four, although we've heard that stages two or three are the real target um, in discussions, I think, with regulators. Um, and uh, another element of inclusion criteria for the clinical trial was fibroscan test or liver biopsy with NASH with fibrosis stage two or three. Metabolic risk factors and AST greater than 20, that's a blood test showing uh, liver dysfunction. And uh, an MRI kind of fat fraction, it's called, test that shows greater than or equal to 8%. So Jen and Tony, as you guys know, very frequently the process does start with um, if the formulary, I mean, if the PNT committee says, yes, it's a clinical go, then you start to look at those eligibility criteria from the clinical trials and you, you wonder about using those as the specifics for your own um, coverage policy. So let me just ask the clinical experts, as you hear those first, are there any that seem absolutely unrelated to whether patients really will or won't benefit from this treatment? Um, for instance, do they need an MRI to show a fat fraction? Is that, was that, would that be important uh, to an insurer to make sure that they're getting the right patients who would, ben who would have the greatest chance of benefiting? Um, we start with that one, perhaps. No, I, so, no, they don't require an MRI. You do require some kind of uh, evidence that there is fatty liver disease, liver enzymes, alone are not sensitive nor specific enough to diagnose it even in metabolic syndrome, although most of the time you're right if you use them. So that would be imaging, but ultrasound showing steatosis is enough, and then you can go on to your FIP4, as Danielle's mentioned, and FibroScan to make that determination. Uh, liver biopsy is not essential either in, in, in that triage as well. So, so I don't think an MRI is essential that will be, uh, nor, nor is a biopsy essential. Um, it, of course, in the trial, it was, uh, you know, uh, utilized. Uh, but I'm hopeful that there will be data showing the, the, the non-invasive biomarkers, how they correlated with the biopsy and the MR findings through the trials predominantly as well. And we have uh, data outside trials as well to allow that to happen. I don't know if it'll happen right away though. Stephen, are, are those data that you guys are thinking of trying to make public as quickly as possible, again, to help guide consideration around diagnosis and staging the, the correlation of, of imaging with the, with the biopsies? Yeah, I, I, um, not just imaging, but other, other potential serological markers as well, because even the imaging is, mm -hmm. depending on which test, including fiber scan, you heard it, it's just not everywhere. So the short answer is yes. I mean, our overall intent is to help clinicians in a clinical setting where biopsy is generally not used. It's, it's used infrequently with the tools that they have available to them to identify the right patients. And frankly, the current guidelines do a pretty good job of that, whether you look at ASLD, ACE, or AGA. They're, they're fairly good as a way to take patients with metabolic risk factors and then using relatively available simple tests say this is a patient likely at intermediate to high risk and then ruling out cirrhosis. So yes, we'll, we will absolutely share our information to help inform that from a clinical perspective, but the guidelines are, are pretty good at that as, as from our perspective, at least as we speak, although I'd be interested in hearing what the clinicians have to say about that. Yeah, I wanna circle back to you guys and forgive my ignorance of the guidelines at that, at that point. 
So, um, and you can play this out if you want a way that Danielle, you did earlier. There's a Fib4 test, which is a blood test in primary care, let's say. Um, and then what happens? Let's assume that that's quote unquote positive. So how does the guideline or the, the algorithm work from then on? And when, and we'll come back to the liver biopsy and whether that does or doesn't need to be a part of this. This The liver biopsy issue came up with hepatitis C, you'll remember that too. Um, but let, let's let's get to there. But let's start with the FIB4 and then move what happens after that. Yeah, so by using the FIB4, you can classify patients as being low, indeterminate, or high risk for having advanced fibrosis, F3 to F4. Um, okay. And if, in general, if a patient has a low risk score, then they can stay in primary care and they should have serial testing to confirm that they are, in fact, low risk. Um, on the other hand, if they fall into the indeterminate or the high risk category, then they do need second line testing. And that can be either with a blood test, which is ELF, um, which is a proprietary panel that can uh, help to stage fibrosis, but doesn't seem to be widely available um, commercially. Um, but then fiber scan is another option, MRI elastography or shear wave elastography. Typically, when you're getting to the point of fiber scan or MR elastography, those patients have typically been referred to hepatology. Um, so it still is a significant proportion of the patients who are going to need some sort of hepatology assessment. And I think a lot of places will still require a hepatology or GI consultation to do a fiber scan, um, just I think really related to the, the reimbursement uh, around that procedure. So then let's assume that the fiber scan is um, indeterminate or high mm -hmm. itself. I'm not sure how fiber scan results come out yeah. in terms of categories, if, if yeah. that's the case. But yeah. even if it's high, do you have any idea of what the positive predictive value of that is for fibrosis two to three? I mean, do you need to do a biopsy to keep a lot of patients from getting treatment who wouldn't otherwise qualify for it? Right. So the, the issue with fiber scan, it is a very good test. And if we look at just C statistic for, you know, predicting significant or advanced fibrosis, it's going to be, you know, anywhere from, you know, 0.8 to 0.9 or so. Um, you know, depending upon what fibrosis stage you're you're looking at, um, and the the issue is that the liver stiffness can be impacted by the severity of the steatosis. So, if you have severe steatosis, if you have liver inflammation with an ALT over 100, that can lead to an overestimation of fibrosis stage. So, I think many hepatologists, if they see F3, F4 on fiber scan, that will typically prompt additional testing. Um, and I think most of us will go to MR elastography um, and then really do biopsy if the results are discordant. All right. So, maybe I can pivot to the pairs for a second. As you hear this flow, you've now gotten a, gotten a patient through to uh, MR elastography. Or, so you don't think the fiber scan by itself is enough to say, yep, I know this patient should start treatment with resmitiram. You would need to do something else. Sorry, it, sorry, it, back to Danielle. Back, back to me, yeah. Right. No, I think, I think it depends. I think that, you know, if you have someone... Um, you know, who has kind of a borderline platelet count, and then you have your, your fiber scan, you know, showing F4, um, then I'm, I'm reasonably confident. I think it's really, um, you know, if you get a high fibrosis score in a patient you weren't expecting, like, let's say it's a younger patient, doesn't have diabetes, liver enzymes are not elevated. Um, in that case, I wouldn't necessarily believe it, but I think in, okay. in many of the patients, I think we, we would believe the fiber scan result. I think there's, in, in practice, I think there's variability in terms of what people do after that fiber scan result. All right. Well, payers hate variability, right? It just doesn't, doesn't work. It, it, it's hard to manage in a way um, because they're trying to figure out, do, do I need to decide that if a doctor gets to a point where they've got a positive fiber scan I will grant coverage or whether I need to say, no, you need to do one more test and it's either an MR elastography or a, uh, or a liver biopsy. Um, now, nobody loves a liver biopsy, right? Nobody likes undergoing it. 
But the more expensive the treatments that we're deciding upon, the more likely that either clinicians and or payers are going to think maybe we should introduce that as a part of coverage criteria. Tony or Jennifer, any early thoughts on your guys' side on what liver biopsy will or will it, whether it will or won't play a role in coverage inside your systems? Well, I, I hope I hope it doesn't. Um, that's what I would say. Uh, the only way to figure out if you can take this is to stick a needle through your abdomen and your liver sounds pretty awful um, and expensive. Um, but what I would say is, you know, from a payer perspective, we do get challenged by a lot of our clients, our payers, around holding true to the data within a lot of these clinical trials. So the inclusion exclusion criteria, um, we get we get pushed on that. So I guess I would say in this, and I would, you know, um, Dr. Saeed, Doc, Dr. Bramman, I, I look look to, to you to like, hey, what's reasonable in clinical practice so we can help uh, put that message forward to make sure that we can identify the truly right patient that needs the drug and not have them go through over onerous testing uh, that's expensive and um, abrasive and harmful. You know, you know so it's, that, I, you know, I, what I would say is like, the the from a pay, from my perspective, the payers that I, I, I work with, you know, they want to rely on the data because that's what's that's what's published, that's what's out there, um, and it's hard for them to get get past that. But we also want to make sure that from a patient perspective, and provider perspective, that that criteria is reasonable and meets the need. So we we sometimes have to bridge that. Emily, I think I was going to turn to you anyway. I wondered if you have a perspective on this issue of liver biopsy as a uh, as a hurdle to get through to get coverage for this? Yes, I was diagnosed without a liver biopsy. Um, I was diagnosed with ultrasound and lab values and symptoms. I did not need a liver biopsy to be diagnosed. So I don't know why that would be necessary before you get treatment. Um, I was biopsied after transplant. And I can tell you, it is not a pleasant experience. And it, it involves a little pain, it involves sedation, it involves uh, the, a day in the hospital because you have to lay flat for so many hours with someone next to your bed, making sure you don't bleed. Um, Pre-transplant, I heard that they are pain even more painful. Now, I, I can't speak firsthand on that. But pre-transplant, when you are cirrhotic, I hear that they are even more painful than post-transplant when they're just checking on your new liver. So I know patients that would not do a clinical trial because the biopsy was part of the trial. And I'm not sure how many patients would, you know, want to get a biopsy to, to be able to get this medicine. So I don't think um, liver biopsy is necessary with fiber scan and with ultrasound. Okay. Thank you. Adna? Uh, no, I, I completely agree with what Kimberly and, and Danielle are mentioning. Liver biopsy is needed in some people, but it is a big barrier and it'll lead to worse in, inequities. So so the, the the protocol, the triage process that Danielle mentioned, the FIP4 and the fibro scan has excellent negative pr uh, predictive value. It will tell us the 70% or more of individuals with NAFLD who don't have advanced disease, who don't, don't need this treatment right away or any treatments like this except lifestyle management. The others is where, where we struggle, right? With the higher fibro scan, the results of over 10 you know, who has fibrosis, who has NASH. And that's where I think the trial will be helpful. That's where the exclusion criteria were helpful you know, poorly controlled diabetes, A1C mm -hmm. over nine and a half percent, ASTLT greater than uh, 10 times upper limit of normal. Those patients should get a biopsy to figure out what's causing that. But a stable patient, um, you know, with, with lower liver enzymes, well-controlled diabetes or stable diabetes, I think the fibro scan's pretty good. And that's where I think it would be helpful for the trials to release some of the data as well and see what their surrogate markers did during the treatment and how they correlated. I think that will be helpful. Agreed. Okay, we could spend more on time on this, but I have a couple other, uh, what I think are important areas I wanna get through. And I also wanna make sure we have time for you guys to make uh, some closing statements. So let's talk about step therapy. 
Um, step therapy here largely includes the idea of whether they would be asked to undergo lifestyle management to try to lose weight first before getting coverage for these um, and or treatment with a GLP-1. Um, from a clinical expert perspective, again, the average weight loss with GLP-1s is around 17 up to 20% with trizepatide. Um, with that much weight loss, should it would it be reasonable for a payer to say, I want them to try that for six months or 12 months and then have a repeat fibro scan or whatever it is? Or is that somehow, I know that you might ultimately think of these drugs as working in tandem, but a lot of what I'd heard before, I think even from you, was that weight loss by itself, we heard about bariatric surgery, but with the new, much more effective weight loss medications, should that be a first line treatment before people get um, access to these drugs, in particular, if these drugs are much more expensive? What do you think? I, I think it's such a great question. And um, I One of the issues I think that people are struggling with right now is getting those drugs approved even for weight loss or diabetes. So even for those indications, it's challenging. Um, you know, they're not yet FDA approved for the specific management of fatty liver disease. Um, and, you know, there are the phase two data, at least for semaglutide, um, you know, suggesting that there may be improvement in NASH, but not necessarily fibrosis. So, you know, I, so I think they're, the, that cl the class of drugs is excellent in terms of weight loss, but I think in terms of accessibility, we're not necessarily there. And I actually don't think we have the data to show that those drugs are antifibrotic, though if they mediate weight loss, then they may have the indirect uh, effect of promoting weight loss. So just, just to be clear again, so let's assume yeah. it is an obese a person with obesity okay. um, who has not been on a GLP-1 before. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding was that the weight loss by itself can basically halt the progression of NASH in some patients and maybe even lead to resolution of fibrosis. So again, in that patient type, if you will, would a, a step therapy approach uh, make sense clinically and by extension, perhaps from a coverage perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think just weight loss in general is definitely yeah. what we kind of promote for these patients, because even if you look at just the, the weight and the BMI, you're not looking at the whole picture because many of these so-called lean patients actually do have central obesity or central adiposity and may actually benefit from weight loss. I think the question is really, yeah, around, you know, fibrosis and what do we think the, the likelihood of success is? I think with the drugs, yes, the likelihood of actually achieving a 10% weight loss is likely to occur. Um, for lifestyle modifications, we know that fewer than 10% of patients are going to get to the 10% threshold. But I think, you know, really the issue is if we were to prescribe these drugs for weight loss, particularly in patients who don't have obesity or diabetes, are those going to be covered? And again, we, we just don't have the data to say it's, um, you know, specifically for treatment of fatty liver disease or fibrosis. Jennifer or Tony, any thoughts from your perspective as you think about your group's meeting to talk about the data on NASH? Will you weave in this idea that if you use a GLP-1 among obese patients with NASH, you might, um, if you will, address both issues, weight and NASH? I think it has to be part of our conversation. Um, I'm sure we will have some kind of criterion related to lifestyle modifications or medications. Um, I think Danielle's point is really well taken. We've got separate criteria for use for semaglutide for diabetes versus weight, and it's harder to get it for weight alone. Um, we have them try other oral agents that frankly are more economical, um, that may not have the same uh, you know, weight loss that we see, but we've had to do that. Semaglutide, when we looked at opening it wider in weight loss, we were looking at hundreds of millions of dollars as well. So we had to make some tough decisions. But I think we will have to look at potentially altering our criteria for some of the weight management drugs in the context of NASH and, and how that looks. Um, I don't know how that conversation will end when we have that, but it's going to have to be taken into consideration. 
Uh, you know, our group has talked about this a little bit. And like Danielle said, there's nothing conclusive that looks at semaglutide and NASH and fibrosis down the line. But I really don't see how we can have the discussion and come up with criteria without addressing that as a point. Um, so I anticipate it will be part of our conversation. Yeah. Uh, Tony, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. If not, I'll, I can go up to Adnan, but Go ahead if you would. Well, I guess I guess I would just add one thing I would say is um, you know, to, to the point, right? There's I don't there's no data around these GLP ones and NASH. So I I don't I don't see, you know, our our P and T drives those clinical decisions. It's hard for me to envision a scenario where that that's what's going to happen. That said, and I see a lot of the primary care docs weighing in here, like a lot of these patients already have these issues anyway. So like you're talking about comorbidities that you have to treat. So like they seem like they will go hand in hand for the majority of the population. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Adnan, go ahead. Yeah, I think weight loss is and lifestyle management is exceptionally important. You know, you, you can't expect to take a drug and this to solve the, the entire spectrum of disease. Uh, but so 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 I I would want patients to be educated about that this drug isn't the only thing you have to do it along with the intensive lifestyle management. But we're not there as, as Danielle's mentioning in terms of you know, NASH fibrosis reversal with weight loss with drugs uh, to say that that should be a first step before people use uh, a drug with for NASH fibrosis reversal, which is what we're talking about for these drugs. So, so until that data comes out with any drugs, I think um, I think it'll be a step forward if people are in programs like MOVE uh, in the VA or have access to nutrition, which doesn't really happen, but, but maybe that's something that, you know, that health systems or companies can look at getting patients access when they are on these drugs, because they need to happen in parallel. So I, I, I think that they are best done in parallel rather than as a stepped approach. The weight loss management and then patients with NASH fibrosis they get medications like this at the same time. I, I do think that a lot of insurers will consider the sequential approach, um, if, if only because, again, even the leading you know, risk of, of death for these patients is cardiovascular. So helping them lose weight is almost more important than addressing fibrosis if it's gonna take them on average seven years to progress from one stage to the next. So I could imagine, as Jennifer said, I, I'm not sure they will, because it does kind of seem like you're taking something from left field and plugging it in uh, into an algorithm that's meant to focus on one specific condition. Um, but I, I would imagine that there'll be a lot of conversation with clinical experts um, and, and with inside insurers about how they manage that. Okay, a couple other things that we need that I, I think are gonna be important for insurers to, to hear your views on. What is the duration of, okay, Kimberly, go ahead. Okay, I wanna speak on where they have to lose weight before they can get this drug or they have to change their lifestyle. When I was little, I was heavy. My brothers weren't, I was. When I, as I was getting older, I was heavy. I've been heavy all my life. So I show up at the doctor and I say, hey, I need this drug. Or he says, hey, you need this drug, but first you need to lose weight. Do you think I've showed up out of the blue? I've tried to lose weight since I was a kid. I went to Weight Watchers, I did Optifast, I did, um, you know, swimming laps. I swam a mile a day, six days a week for over a year. You know, it's not like we're showing up and here we are, brand new fat. We've been fat, we've been trying to lose weight for years and years and years. We've already tried that. We've already tried this step up thing. And we need help. We need help with either the drugs or the, the weight loss surgery are consistent uh, input from, uh, you know, physicians or, you know, Weight Watchers, they're there for, you know, profit, you know, that's profit. We need someone in the healthcare community to help us lose weight. And I agree, losing weight is the most important thing. You wouldn't even have to worry about NASH in most people. Now there's another point. There's lean NASH. How about those people? What are they going to do when they show up to the doctor and they have to lose weight? I mean, that's just ridiculous. What are, what's the criteria for lean NASH? I have a friend right now in California who just went on hospice care because she has lean NASH. She's decompensated. 
but she's stuck in right there where her milk is low and she can't get a transplant. We're not showing up at your office, never trying to lose weight. We're not lazy. We're not, we, it's not that we don't care. It's that we need help. And this, I was, I'm just sitting here listening to this thinking, well, they need to try to lose weight first. And we have been, I mean, that's just the, the truth of it. We're not showing up. We've been trying to lose weight all our lives, most of us. I think that is really helpful and very important that you said that. Um, is the idea of just throwing, go try some lifestyle management on your own or somehow just using that as a barrier to care wouldn't be in anybody's best interest. Um, and so I think that's that's really, really a good point. There may be some ways that doctors and even insurers can help, you know, people who have tried before, either with the new medicines or the surgery, or at least make those okay. options available oh. and present it. But the question, again, will be whether you do that in parallel or in sequence, I think will be a really, really important question. All right. I want to talk about the duration of treatment now, because uh, like any chronic disease that might get better or might not, people are going to say, well, is this something you need to take for the rest of your life? Is there a chance I can get off of this? How long? And an insurer might say, uh, what, 25 to 30% of patients had a positive response. That means around 70% didn't. Um, am I going to want to continue paying for a drug over many years when it's not having any effect? So how does this work, clinical experts? We start a patient on one of these two drugs. What's a reasonable amount of time to wait until you would want to check again to see if it's having a beneficial effect? And what is a beneficial effect? Can we use the outcomes from the clinical trials to decide whether the drug is working? Or is there some other way that we need to think about doing that? Um, let, let's start there. How long before you want to check to see if it's working or not? I mean, I think we'll be checking liver enzymes for sure. And you know, uh, improvement in liver enzymes is correlated with improvement in liver histology. So reduction in steatosis and steatohepatitis. So that you'll see presumably quickly. Um, but in terms of, you know, fibrosis assessment, you know, I'd say fiber scan annually. Um, and I, you know, I'd want to follow them probably, you know, at, at least a year, if not two, before determining are they having, you know, improvement in fibrosis. Um, but I think it goes back to the question of, well, if you have someone who's F3 and they're still at F3, would they have progressed if they weren't on treatment? Of course, we have no way of knowing that. Um, but yeah, I think that that would be my initial approach. Adnan? Yeah, I, I agree. So, you know, we, although we poo-poo liver enzymes, they are helpful in stopping rules. Um, so we use it in vit vitamin E and pioglitazone at six months, as Danielle is saying, to figure out who's responding and continue them on it for longer and then stopping. Uh, as far as fibrosis, I agree it'll take a year, 18, 18 months of doing either fibro scan or liver biopsy if needed uh, to, to do that. I, I think it'd be exceptionally helpful if there are if there are surrogate markers, non-biopsy non markers of uh, futility that are early, you know, at six to 12 months. I don't know if they exist. The company has data. It'd be great to see that. Uh, short of that, we'll be doing fibro scan at a, at a year, I suspect, and then stopping. I, I don't think it'll be forever. If you do see non-progression, it's hard to know how long to continue the drug. I know. That's, <laughs> I was going to ask you. Yeah, I know. that That's always going to be the tough one. If they're getting worse, you tick a box. They're not responding to treatment, and I guess you would stop clinically, perhaps, and from a payer perspective. But if they're stable, does that mean it's working or not? again, when it could take seven years on average to progress anyway, creates a real conundrum in, in some sense um, until we know more about how to track biomarkers to, to really decide whether it's having a beneficial effect or not. Okay, apologies to keep running through some important issues at a pretty high speed. The last one before we wanna talk a bit about pricing and, and uh, kind of outcomes contracting, et cetera, would be about the provider restrictions that are sometimes part of insurance coverage. This has been addressed a couple of times before, but an insurance company now is going to write a coverage policy and they need to decide, 
um, only hepatologists can prescribe these drugs or PCPs and anybody like them can prescribe these drugs. Um, and there are, there are all kinds of both scientific and system and access and equity issues involved in this. But let me ask you if, if from trying to take your view of all of those factors, uh, Adnan and uh, Danielle, do you think that primary care doctors can prescribe these drugs? Do they need to be in consultation with an expert? Can they do it all by themselves? What do you think? I think there'll be there, there'll be a ramp up period where it'll be the specialists utilizing it more, getting used to it, getting their protocols right, and then and then of course primary care can prescribe it. These are not necessarily very complicated, but they need they would need some partnership with with uh, with specialists, you know, either like a scan echo system or an e-console system where we tell them how to triage patients, how to follow patients, starting and stopping rules. And then this will belong in the primary care era eventually, like hep C is in many systems. Danielle, does that seem right? Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the question is, how are these patients being staged? Um, are they going to be able to be accurately staged in primary care? I think if they are accurately staged, then yes, I think eventually we'll get there. Then the other question is with, you know, patient with stage three fibrosis, you know, very close to cirrhosis. And um, aside from just medication management, should they be seeing a hepatologist um, to really monitor for early signs of, of cirrhosis? Um, but I think in terms of care models, you know, we can certainly look to things like ECHO um, that has been used in the VA population to treat hepatitis C. So that that may be a model that will come forth in the future. Jennifer, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, the ECHO model, I'm familiar with it. It's kind of a hub and spoke kind of approach. Um, how do you foresee this in the VA? Yeah, I think that that hub and spoke approach might be reasonable. We know we don't have enough hepatologists across the system. We know that some of our primary care providers, I think, will be a little bit leery about taking this on on top of other things. So there has to be something in the middle. Um, so, you know, we've managed similar, you know, specialized diseases where, you know, it's just too much impact for the specialty. Um, we've used the echo kind of model. Um, sometimes when we write the coverage criteria, it might be that the initial prescription needs to be by a specialist, but then ongoing management can be done in consultation with primary care or, you know, somebody else. A lot of times when we write our criteria, recognizing that we have different complexity facilities all across the country, you know, some are bigger, some have offer more complex care than others. We usually build in a little wiggle room for a locally designated expert too. So I think that it may be a combination of all those modalities. Um, for us, it's a pretty large patient population. So I think just leveraging all of our resources together and figuring out what makes sense is how we'll land. But I think we'll have to do some of that. I just know we don't have enough specialist providers at all of our facilities to manage the patient load. All right, thanks. Okay. Stephen, you have been very patient. I think I had you answer one of the very first questions, but it's been a while. So let's come back and talk about pricing and payment um, mechanisms. So again, you don't have an FDA approved drug yet. There's no price on the table. Um, you, you, you get, in some ways, you could say the benefit of a, another drug that will be approved first, and there will be another price in the market uh, if they do get approved that you will, in a sense, uh, leverage in your own thinking about, about pricing. But in general, really in general, across both you and, and Intercept, is the thinking about pricing here, do you think people are pegging their thoughts about fair pricing to the GLP-1 prices? Are they pegging it to value where we actually said a fair price range would be higher than what some analysts are predicting in the high teens annually? Um, I know all of these, quote unquote, go into your blender when it Kind of gets done of you know eventually, but what's what do you think the landscape kind of has been looking like as far as how you think about pricing and when you go in to talk to payers, what those kinds of conversations kind of focus on? Yeah, so you you won't love my entire answer here, but first of all, I'm in medical affairs, so I'm actually not directly involved in our pricing strategy, and I can't give you detailed comments, and I really can't speak on behalf of Intercept, but what we 
two things I'll point out, and then we can talk more about it as you as you have questions. One is we will determine our price and then announce that price with FD approval. It's it's heavily predicated on what the label really read like, reads like. Mm -hmm. The other is broadly, um, there are a whole variety of factors that are going into the mix, including a very strong awareness of the fact that there aren't treatments available right now and there are patients that are going to expect access and affordability and, and ability to get to these drugs. So we're thinking about it broadly, taking in inputs such as the ISA review, our conversations with payers, et cetera, to come up with a very responsible approach and then holistically consider the patient in this both can they get access to the drug and is the drug affordable? So I know that's a pretty generic answer, but that's how we're thinking about it. I, I appreciate it. I know you're in a situation again where you can't, even if you did have a price in the market, it's not really possible to always discuss all the different permutations that you examined beforehand. Um, Jen and, and Tony, you guys have been part of these discussions with manufacturers for, for many years. Um, potentially large population, as Jennifer said, um, as everybody knows, um, perhaps not that much uptake though, if it's targeted to um, specialty care, if it's targeted to patients who have already had a liver biopsy and in the short term at least. So one of the questions I had for you is, I think there's a huge amount of uncertainty around what the utilization will be. We still don't know the FDA label, obviously, but even if we did, I still think it's, this is a tricky one. I could imagine there could be a relatively slow uptake over many years um, with a short blip at the front end for the warehoused you know, patients. Um, is this a situation in which you would consider wanting some kind of contract linked to utilization where you could say to the manufacturer, look, here's our best guess at how many patients are gonna be treated in the first year. If it ends up being twice that many with your drug, will you basically cut us a rebate uh, based on that usage above our target that we think is going to be uh, what the use will be. Um, some people actually overseas have used that as a, basically, we're going to pay you this much money and it doesn't matter whether we treat 100 patients or 10,000 patients. It's kind of like a subscription model. The, the less aggressive version of that is just setting some kind of escalating rebate as utilization goes above a certain uh, kind of guest at target. And would that be a conversation you could imagine having having with a, of a manufacturer in this situation, or is it just too complicated to, to work out? Let me start with the payers, and Steve, I'll come back to you. You may not, again, in medical affairs, be part of this kind of contracting discussion, but Jennifer, what do you think? Yeah, I, my gut is that I'll be having all kinds of conversations about creative pricing. We have some constraints because of federal laws about what we can and we can't do, which uh, makes us have to get a little bit more outside of the box. But what I've seen in the past is where companies, you know, come in with the price out of the gates and say, you know, if you happen to achieve this level of utilization over this time period, we'll deepen the discount. We don't really do rebates. Um, the only time we do credits back is if we do a value-based contract. So usually it's it's an upfront price. I think that would be a reasonable approach because I do think it will be very difficult to predict how many patients will get it and how quickly. So I could see different levels of discount um, depending on utilization. Again, um, I wish I had a crystal ball because I think a lot of that is, you know, still we're waiting to see in the data and then how we're going to apply it to our population. I would guess that, you know, maybe some outcomes based contracting here, you know, maybe if the patient, if the score is staying consistent and they're not progressing or they improve, you know, some kind of credit back there, um, I'd be interested in entertaining any kinds of conversations like that. This one I think will be hard to do with a flat price just up front because of all the variability around it and how the criteria will be. So I think it's definitely on the table for some creative pricing arrangements. Tony, what do you think? So I, I agree with, with Jennifer and too, um, where I, I can't really envision a say like uh, this many units is this price and this many units is that price and escalating up and decreasing um, in, in this situation. I think um, what what some of the concerns, and there are concerns around predictability, but there's also concerns specific. I mean, this isn't just the drug costs, right? Like there's a whole lot of testing and follow up and navigating the system. 
And I, I'm sure that um, you know the, the manufacturers have those same type of concerns around making sure that the patient can navigate through the pharmacy benefit and the medical benefit because they're going to get you know, there is likely going to have to be some level of testing and having to go through um, prim, a primary care and consultation with a specialist and then going to a different place for a test and, and navigating this whole thing. So the question I think what we would look at is is how can we help work together with the system to enable the right patient to actually see it through versus getting some kind of testing, not following through, and that's just wastage uh, at the end of the day is what com that comes out to. So I think we would look at some outcomes or value-based type of, uh, type of arrangements where we all have a stake in the game to making sure that those right patients get the right drug and go see, see through the process and continue to make sure it's working. Um, would, would be, I think, how we would look at trying to work together to, to get to a, a, a fair and predictable, you know, price. Thanks. Steve, I'll let you have a last comment on this, but after, I just have a guess myself. My guess is that once you get down into the weeds of trying to come up with an outcomes-based contract, it's going to be very difficult because the clinical experts are going to be using different tests to decide whether the patient is progressing or not. Um, it's going to be hard to standardize the terms by which you'll judge whether patients are, are receiving the benefit, if you will, of the treatment. I guess if they're still taking it, you would assume it's working. But I, I just think it might be trickier here than a lot of the other outcomes-based agreements, whereas a utilization-based agreement at least would give some relative budget certainty to a payer um, to a certain extent, just given how hard it is to guess what the uptake is going to be um, in the even in the short term. But I see there, I, I know there are also issues around setting up an outcome, I mean, a utilization-based uh, outcomes agreement. Stephen, I don't know if you're, you and your team talk about these issues at all. You, you may help inform those who are doing the kinds of contracting as they think about outcomes-based contracts. What, 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 what's your perspective? So I don't have a very deep, profound insight into it at this point because we're fairly early into it. But I mean, I, I think from the perspective of medical affairs, we first want to characterize the full value of Rosmeteram through the perspective of clinical, economic, and humanistic. And then from there, in, you know, in conversation with payers, try to understand what's the most appropriate way then to value the drug and then make it available to patients at, you know, with access being critical, obviously. And it becomes, in, in the drugs that I've worked on, I've worked on many, this is one of those rare times where there just aren't any treatments. So the idea of access for treatment becomes so much different than when you're talking about the fourth or fifth agent into a disease area or the hundredth agent. So we're looking at it holistically, but it's very early days and I really don't have specific comment. Okay, no, I, I, again, I, I understand. Um, again, in my experience, when payers have a lot of uncertainty about um, the utilization, and it could be very big with a big population, you are more likely to see them be very conservative with their clinical criteria around coverage because it's the one way they have to control some of that uncertainty. And part of me would prefer to see a little bit more liberal um, approach to clinical coverage if we can create some certainty about the budget impact in a different way, perhaps by having some kind of um, scaled uh, discount or rebate linked to, uh, to utilization. Just, just something, again, that there's always gonna be some back and forth on this in different, in different ways, but we'll, we'll all be watching this carefully. As, and Tony looks like you wanted to jump in, but I, I think this will be an interesting example and kind of case study to how we can hopefully get it right. Tony? Yeah, so Stephen, I guess what I would say, I agree with you, um, you know, a lot of times the, the question is on, on the criteria, but that, that will be based on the label and kind of what, what the data says. I think, I think what we have the opportunity here, um, especially um, with Jennifer, you know, being in a, in, in more of a closed system, patients do, these, and I think especially any patient, but these patients especially where they're not necessarily having symptoms, it's easy to get lost in the system and just stop, you know, and so once once we I once you know you get the word out right and, and manufacturer you, know, you guys will do a great job doing that but like helping the patient see it through I think payers are in a very good position to to help do that um, you know administering the benefit 
and you know working with the manufacturer and that and, you know it's hard to do outcomes based on regions the data and all that kind of stuff but we have an opportunity here i think to work together to to ensure that once that patient you know you know whether the criteria is conservative or not once you identify that patient having that best vested interest in seeing it through right we have access we're you know and and working with the across those benefits to get, to get the testing that you need, get the drug and, and get that follow-up. And, and that's what some kind of arrangements can be based on. Yeah, I, I see your point. Absolutely true. The biggest waste here would be starting a patient on this treatment and having it all just kind of fall apart because the system makes it hard to get tests or whatever it is, and they just stop taking the drug. Okay. I apologize for the speed with which I had to move through some of those um, important issues. I really want to thank you guys for all your comments. I want to now offer you the chance to, to have a, a final say, if you will. And what we, what we usually do is we ask you to just have a, a single sentence um, as your closing statement. And it can either be something that's already been said and you just want to hit it on the head one more time as a ringing endorsement of an idea that you want everybody to walk away with. Um, I also would invite you to make it a request. If you could make a request of any of the stakeholders at this table, virtual table, um, to do something or something different to make sure to, that we would get the right outcome at the end of the day for these new treatments as they come into practice, what would that look like? Um, so please think about what your final statement would be. If you use a well-placed semicolon, that, that can help you, um, but do try to keep it uh, brief to one sentence. And I'm gonna let the, the patient go last. So let me start please with uh, you, Steve. Yeah, I think, Two things I'd like to say, and there will be a prominent semicolon, okay? The first, so benefit is going to be very important to deeply understand as it relates to treatment because it, it goes beyond the biopsy results, and yet the biopsy results are what you see in, in the trial. So I think as we learn about that, that'll be important. Semicolon, I think at the end of the day, we have to keep the fact that there's a tremendous unmet need in the patient space. We have to keep them center in this. And as we go through this rigmarole of understanding the treatments and how you work patients up, we have to keep them front and center because it'll be very easy to lose them in the shuffle. Thank you very much. Um, payers, let me start with, uh, well, Tony just dropped off. So let me go to Jennifer. I hope I didn't lose him. Oh, he's back, but Jennifer, go ahead. <laughs> And I had similar thoughts, actually. I think, you know, really keeping our focus on patient-centric care, which patients are most likely to benefit and prioritizing based on that will really be the key to assuring access to these drugs. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, thanks, Steve. But what I'd say is, you know, from a payer perspective, new therapy for something that we don't have anything to treat. So want to be supportive of it and make sure that it's successful. Um, so I'd ask everybody, you know, all the stakeholders here that when you look at the data, how do we get, how do we get to criteria that the data supports that's going to identify those right patients? And then how do we as a system support that patient all the way through to make sure they get the testing and, uh, and what they need to, to, to be supported? All right, thank you. Adnan? Uh, yeah, I think it's key to remember that, you know, patient, the patients are at the center of all this, patients with silent but progressive disease. So for the system and for the payers to support those patients would go a long way in terms of getting them access to testing. Uh, mm -hmm. Like if Danielle mentioned, if L score is what's needed, maybe that comes with a drug access to paying for nutrition, all of those things are important support pieces of, uh, that will show that the systems and payers are, are committed to these patients and then things, things uh, hopefully will move forward. Wonderful, thanks. Danielle? Um, I am excited that I may finally have a medication to offer to my patients, but I think we have to make sure that our systems in all aspects of the word um, are really ready to identify and accurately classify these patients and efficiently deliver the drug to these patients. And then we also have to continue on with research to better understand what are the appropriate endpoints and lengths of treatment. 
Thank you very, very much. Kimberly? When I was first diagnosed, I was absolutely shocked. I was even more shocked to find out there were no treatments for NASH. At the end of the day, we can have a great effective drug, but if we make it too expensive or too hard to get, what's the point? See, everybody, when given a sentence, does just brilliantly. I think we should ask our politicians someday to try it. So um, I really appreciate all of the insights, um, sophisticated and to the point. Um, you guys have been wonderful in informing our CPAC's deliberation. You've been wonderful in informing the report over eight months for many of you. And um, you'll, hear our, you'll hear thanks from members of the CPAC as they go around to do the same thing. I hope you can stay through the next half hour. Um, if you have to drop off, I understand. But thank you from me and from ICER very, very much. Reem, let me hand it back over to you to lead the CPAC um, in final comments. Thank you, Steve. And thank you for a really um, a very thoughtful and uh, great discussion that we just heard, bringing up um, a lot of the issues and struggles uh, that we all will have to deal with moving forward, uh, but at least uh, helping us think about them proactively. Uh, I'm actually going to ask my fellow CPAC member to turn on their cameras so I can see that they're here. Would love to hear your final thoughts. Like Steve says, um, one sentence with a semicolon is, is okay. And I will um, be the last to comment. So I'm going to say, let's uh, start with uh, Kurt. Yeah, thanks everybody for uh, the conversation. I learned a lot in the process. Um, I've got a couple comments, but um, as a pharmacist, I wonder about real world data about drug interactions with resmeteron. We know about OCA, but to, in the real world, because it's a novel mechanism of action, I wonder about unusual ADRs, adverse drug reactions that could occur. I wonder about uh, compliance um, in the real world where this is often silent. Um, so by stopping the drug, would it worsen things? I don't know. And of course, I wonder about fair pricing <clears throat> so that we can get access uh, to these meds. Um, that's all I had. Thanks. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, Eric. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Always. This is uh, just a bright spot in my in my year of getting to do these uh, these panels. It's always a incredibly thoughtful conversation, always very challenging. Um, this case um, also like, you know, many others. Um, I think my you know takeaway on this one is um, it's a common chronic condition and, you know, the, the science, so to speak on this one around the prevention of what we're trying to prevent here, which is cirrhosis and the, the devastating quality of life regarding transplantation. I mean, the high cost of that are just unknown. So there's, you know, I, I think I would love to say that, um, this drug is going to deliver, um, like um, so many other category killers that we've had and in, in, that have come up in the last 10 years. And I hope that it does. Um, but I think that the evidence today was, was not that we have a category killer um, in front of us. Thank you, Eric. Um, Ellen. I would just echo a comment that was made earlier that, and I know this isn't completely analogous to the hep C situation, but I feel like there's enough parallels that there's a lot to learn from that, that I think we can do better this time around. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Sneha. Yeah, I really enjoyed the policy round table in particular, um, the talk about misinformation. I think that's really huge we're thinking about a condition like NASH. Um, I also really just want to echo what um, Kimberly said in terms of stigma. Um, I think patients try really hard and there's just so much to expect from patients who are seeking treatment. But at the same time, um, I think multidisciplinary care is so important. And with an introduction or introduction of drugs like these, we still need to really be paying attention to dietitians and making sure we have access to all um, care partners as part of the medical journey. The last thing I'll just say really quickly is um, I think it'll be really interesting to look at also the issue of patents, uh, especially post-approval when we're thinking about issues of equity and long-term access to treatments like these. Um, I think that's something that patients and patient groups 
should be paying more attention to, especially with widespread conditions um, like NASH and the potential for inequity of access to care. Thank you so much, Nia. Uh, Gregory. Thank you, Reem. Um, I remain concerned that the critical data uh, have not yet been published uh, in a peer-reviewed publication. Um, I think that to for us to be drawing conclusions, for ICER to be drawing conclusions in the report, and for us to be drawing conclusions here today uh, is premature. Um, and I'm puzzled that there's been no publication um, of the phase three Rismeteron trial, for example. Uh, I, I just, I, I don't see why we don't have that in front of us when we're having these discussions. So I would defer conclusions uh, until a publication was available. Um, and uh, that's just where I come down on this. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Um, Ingva? Yeah, um, I have to take the data as the data is. So I, I know it, there is obviously a lot of uncertainty, but if it turns out to be like it is, at least it's something that we can work with. And as frontline hepatologists, we're excited that we have potentially now a the first drug that actually may work. Um, it reminds me a little bit about hep C. So I'm just hoping that from a pricing perspective, this is not going to be like hep C, where it was highly cost-effective, completely unaffordable. Thank you. Thank you, Ingva. Angela. Hey, maybe we'll we'll skip to Heather. Sure, hi. Um, so the first thing I want to do is is take a little bit of a different tact and just really express my gratitude, uh, especially Kim relate to you uh, and to others who shared their stories today. I know that it's a very vulnerable position to be in, and and it's greatly appreciated. Um, you know, patients are the reason that we are all here. Um, you know, they are not the objects of change. They are the drivers of change. And that is never far from my mind. So I want to thank everybody for their compelling discussions, uh, the conversation and, and their vulnerable, um, brave storytelling. You know, I, I don't know that um, we really arrived at, um, you know, any sort of uh, Sorry, Heather, you're breaking up. I'm wondering if it's only me. I believe others are hearing breaking up as well. Yeah, we, we should probably so, just. Sorry. Did, did you get any of that? <laughs> we, we, got, we got a good proportion of it, and we appreciate your, your input and you being here. Thank you, Heather. Um, I'm going to go next to. I'm uh, just hopeful for. For the drug. Yeah, I believe you, you thank definitely the patients and you're hopeful for the drug to be accessible by patients. Thank you so much for your comments. I'll yes. go to Tim McBride. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks so much. And um, I also want to thank Kimberly so much and um, all the other um, uh people who contributed to this. And I also want to thank my colleagues for a really thoughtful um, work that was done. I always learned so much from, from you all. I have to say this was a really tough, tough meeting, than, much tougher than I thought it was. When Steve asked us, are we a yes or I was a no? I was actually in the middle and I was really didn't know how I was going to vote. And I had to listen really hard to both my colleagues. And so, um, or all my colleagues. So that's uh, it, it, that's how hard this decision was. It was very frustrating. I think the lack of peer-reviewed evidence, um, lack of long-term evidence, and I really have a strong desire to want to help the patients. And on a really tough um, 
situation, just lung chronic disease and the disparities are a really tough issue with uninsured and high costs and um, where the, the the disease falls. And but you know we may end up making the problem worse if the costs are really high. So, Thank you so thanks. much, Tim. Thank you, uh, Tim Well. Th uh, thanks so much to everybody uh, previously. Uh, I want to uh, probably echo and support what Greg, Eric, and Ben just said previously and the importance of us really knowing whether this is going to work or not. And particularly, I was influenced by the policy roundtable where I hear the strong potential for this getting rolled out, implemented in ways that we don't know, with we don't know information and the implications for uh, widespread screening and treatment, including uh, um, the delivery of care by primary care physicians that are likely to crowd out other uh, uh, high priority health areas. Uh, in their limited time and ability that they have. So I think it's just critically important that we find out accurately whether it works uh, uh, prior to making these recommendations and rolling it out. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Stuart? Uh, thank you. This was obviously a very challenging and illuminating topic. Uh, our deliberations were extraordinarily well served, though, by our two clinical experts. And I just thank both of you for your clarity and your insights. It was especially useful. And thanks for uh, the diversity of the public comments. I thought uh, it was particularly diverse and, and well-rounded. I much appreciated that. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Jill. Thank you, Reem. I, I think this topic was a valuable one. I've rounded on Team 3A here at the University Hospital in Little Rock for 29 years, and we have a big liver um, population, a lot of whom have NASH. Um, so it has been awfully sad for many years to not have something for them. Um, I do look forward to this peer-reviewed published data as well as the clinical endpoint data that hopefully will emerge in my lifetime or in my career. Um, I do commend the outstanding expert. I think y'all gave me a lot of insight that, um, I don't know, I haven't had those conversations. And so thank you for that insight. Um, I felt myself, my opinions changing as we went through the value, the uh, perspective, the second, the third through six votes, I kept swaying back and forth. And so I uh, appreciate the Midwest CPAC's opinions because that, I think, helped me think through it a lot better. And I really hope the prices of these drugs emerge at lower than the placeholder prices. So for what that's worth. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jill and, and everybody. I, I believe uh, all the members of the Midwest CPAC have, have spoken not true. Um, Albert. Yeah, thank you, Reem. No, and, and thank you to the patients and the caregivers. Uh, I just wanna say that, um, you, know, uh, you know, we have now, um, you know, scientific innovation in this area that prior to, did not have any. And so there's, it's very promising and exciting. I wanna point out that the, as, that we, we in the cost effectiveness analysis for resmeteron, we have a finding that actually rarely happens, which is the drug was actually cost saving over the lifetime of a patient. And if you remember all the ICER report, you know, this does not happen very often. So it's very promising, and of course we need more data. Um, but um, you know, when I first heard, you know, thought about these uh, this topic area, it, it, there is something that bothers me though, which is. You know, we, we do have within our lane in ICER and Midwest CPAC a consideration of drugs, but this is part, NASH and NAFLD are part of the broader obesity and diabetes epi, meta, metabolic disease epidemic. We're pro, sort of approaching this problem with a pharmacologic lens, but there's clearly something wrong with our overall policy portfolio for obesity because we're not going to be able to solve the obesity and diabetes epidemic um, and or NAFLD or NASH epidemic uh, with drugs alone. And so there needs to be sort of some right sizing of the overall approach from a policy perspective. I know that's beyond ICER, Steve, but it, it has to be said. Thank you so much, um, Albert. Well, uh, with that, I come to my 
a uh, couple of sentences uh, with the, with a couple of semicolons. Uh, I want to start by um, uh, thanking um, uh, ICER for providing a really, really well-written and very clear report, especially Jeff and Kongu and team did a wonderful job, uh, all the ICER staff uh, for the huge effort that it takes to put this meeting together and make sure all the perspectives are heard, um, I uh, especially want to thank our clinical expert and uh, patient expert. Um, I appreciate that all the discussions were well grounded in, in reality. And while uh, nobody lost uh, uh, the excitement about uh, the fact that there is a new treatment, uh, at the same time, we were able to discuss the realities of our imperfect healthcare system. Uh, that is very much appreciated. Uh, definitely thank all my fellow members of the MedWest uh, CPAC. I too found myself thinking about where my decision would be. And I typically, before these meetings, um, try to read and make decisions, but few of them changed today because of these discussions. So there is no way that anything could actually be more valuable than these um, different stakeholders, different perspective um, I, I want to thank uh, all the people who came today to comment, the manufacturers, the patients and patients group, uh, and, and uh, actually having explicit discussion about the caregiver uh, role here. So thank you for all that. And, and um, my, my last uh, sentence is, Kurt, it was interesting that I asked you to start and you talked about real world data. And that was the one point I have wanted to mention, we do need a lot of data in this case, um, both about how these medications, what are the true benefits when we roll them out, the long-term benefit, but we also need data about who's accessing care. Are we truly reaching to the group who needs these medications the most? How long should we give them? When do we stop them? Lots of unanswered questions, and hopefully uh, we will have systems a structured plan for how do we, we can collect this data. Um, Steve, I would be um, remiss if I don't thank you for a wonderful job uh, that you always do, and I'll turn it back to you. Oh, thank you, Reem. Well, you, you did a marvelous job of chairing it, uh, CPAC. My hat's off to you guys again. Um, tremendous discussion. I thought the, the, the comments that we had before the vote um, on Resmediram in particular that really helps all of us think clearly, and it certainly helps the public and stakeholders listening understand the issues as you wrestle with them. Um, and really, I think really probe or kind of challenge all of us to think differently sometimes. Um, a couple of quick points. One is, again, I also, I thank the entire policy roundtable. I'd like to do that again, the time, the effort, um, the goodwill. Um, the manufacturer, I'd also like to highlight, um, participated extremely well throughout the process and being on the policy roundtable is a sign of a responsible um, corporation, in my mind, willing to come into a public setting, answer questions to the best that they can, not dodge things, but just address them as, as honestly as possible. To do so shows a lot of uh, class. Um, I'm going to start also, before I have a couple other closing comments, with my request my request is of Dr. Brandman and Dr. Saeed. Um, I want you guys, in order for the world to be a better place uh, in regards to NASH treatment, you guys need to form an, a limited liability company um, and educate primary care physicians and patients around the country uh, with a series of YouTube webinars, um, concerts, whatever it takes, because the two of you provide tremendous grounding in a broad view of this condition of the better care for patients and of the understanding of the limitations as well as the promise in some of these data. So go out and conquer um, the world because uh, we could all benefit from that. Uh, so a couple other things. One is obesity. Um, someone kind of mentioned this, but uh, it feels like we, like everybody else, we have our own little bite at obesity, so to speak, right? We look at one drug for it here, one drug for it there. Oh, there's a surgery out, you know, in the next room. And we as a society, maybe as a world, just do not know what we're doing and we don't have a comprehensive approach. So there's nothing, again, that ICER can do or that, you know, but I, I hope that we can over time come up with a, a way to talk, much as you guys do in public here, around evidence, around values, around broader goals, 
around obesity as a, as a larger topic. Um, World Health Care Organization, its number one recommendation isn't about drugs or uh, surgeries. It's about advertising to children of sugar-laced uh, food. So we have to somehow figure out how to get all of this together because if we keep figuring out ways to spend $20,000 a year to treat obesity with different approaches, uh, that's not going to help us as a society or even ultimately help patients. Um, around the evidence, I also shared your wrestling with the, you know, the difficulty of saying whether this evidence was adequate or not. My own perspective is somewhat that when we are dealing with a true, if you could call it a public health issue, where there are going to be millions of patients potentially treated, not overnight, but soon, we should expect a higher standard of evidence with more certainty before we kind of launch forward into a broad application of a new treatment. Um, it just seems like one of my tenets would be, um, if not waiting, having some way to manage that uncertainty before we uh, you know, address a public health problem this broadly with something this new. The two uh, second issues around pricing, um, where again, our approach with our modeling is based around the long-term value but as some of you have already said, and some of the stakeholders at the Policy Roundtable, long-term value is not always equal to short-term affordability. And so there again, when we have a massive population, at least eligible, um, we can talk about the long-term value for money fair price, but we should also think about a lower price that's more affordable because with greater affordability really comes that better opportunity for access that can help with health equity issues. Uh, we cannot price everything to value for uh, conditions that afflict millions and millions of Americans. So with that, we need better evidence, right, for public health issues. We need lower pricing, and we need Dr. Sprandman and Saeed to, uh, to be our guides. With that, I want to thank all of you again. Um, we'll look forward to turning around a final version of this report, which will capture as best we can the richness of this discussion and the votes that will come out in just a few weeks around May 26th. And until then, I want to wish you all well, and um, hopefully we will find out more about these treatments and other approaches to obesity, and we'll revisit that at some future date. Thank you to everybody.